gigabytes and whatever else those little things are and uh, amen that are out there. I, I don't want to <coughs> confuse you with all this technical terms. <laughs> praise the Lord, because I don't know anything about them. I have problems getting my own email, so praise God. But God is good. Amen. And just to give you an example, this looks like a porcupine. It's because I didn't even know if we were going to have PowerPoint this morning, so my whole message is right here in little tabs, praise the Lord, just in case. You know, I did it this way for about 20 years before we had all this other stuff available, so it's not a new thing for me. It's just I have to kind of remind myself how I did it, praise the Lord. Amen. So God is good. Everybody okay? Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So, uh, you know, because we're getting older, Sally and I, actually Sally's getting older. She's older than I am. She's kind of a shark or something, but. Uh, but because we are getting older, Sally wanted me to uh, put a bar in the shower, fully stocked. <laughs> hey, man. Got to work out those. <laughs> yeah, okay, praise the Lord. Well, anyway, God's in a good mood, amen. And, uh, you know, I used to make a lot of money selling tires. Those were the good years. <laughs> Praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Okay, so I want to let's go. I want to begin in the book of Jonah this morning. Uh, Jonah one, and we'll start with verses one through three, Peter. And uh, while he's pulling that up, well, actually has it already. I was listening while I was getting ready for church this morning. I was listening to a a well known. Uh, preacher, pastor, and uh, y'all would know who I'm talking about. If I just mentioned his name, all, everybody would know him, I'm sure. But I was kind of surprised because he preaches faith and uh, the Word of God, but uh, he said that, and it kind of, it just really surprised me. I don't know why it did, because you hear so much mixture in what people are preaching, you know, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, a little bit of the law and a little bit of grace, and but he said, the grace is not the gospel. Well, it is, because, and he, and he also went on to say, to prove his point, I have a doctorate. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So, you know, big deal. But uh, I just, I thought, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace is the gospel. It's not, he said it's a doctrine. It's not a doctrine. It's a person. And that's the gospel. That's the message. That, the good news is that Jesus has come and flip this whole thing. It's not about religion anymore. It's not about you keeping a bunch of rules and regulations. It's about Him having kept them all and then imputed that to you and giving you the benefit of what He's accomplished. So that we're not working to get this. We're just rejoicing in the fact that He's given it to us freely. Amen? And so, anyway, that's... It made me think that you see this all the time. I mean, you think somebody's... They're preaching grace... Or they're preaching Jesus when, in fact, they're actually preaching a bunch of mixed up stuff that is some Jesus and some Old Covenant, Old Testament law, some rules, some, you know, freedom. And so it just, it's confusing to people. And one of the things I think, and this is not to bring any attention to myself, only that, you know, I said years ago, the Lord told me if I didn't look, go back to the Bible and look at it, and I came from a very, you know, religious background, uh, you know, it was a Pentecostal, but it was very religious and very rule and, you know, law oriented. So when the Lord told me that if you don't go back to the Bible and read it like you've never read it before, not meaning just read a whole bunch more than you read, but read it in a way that you haven't ever looked at it. Look, look at it with, you know, new eyes here instead of just through the old prism of whatever you've been taught, then nothing will ever change. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I thought that meant, okay, if I do that, then we'll have a really huge church. And maybe that'll happen some point. But that's not what he was telling me. What he was telling me, I can't be changed unless I can look at this in the way that he intended us to look at it. So it's not surprising to me that almost every week we have a new obstacle to overcome. I mean, as a church. Because the enemy doesn't want this message out there. This is the message that will set people free. This is the message that will bring people into a place of peace where they can really trust God and have confidence that God's going to do what he's promised to do. And it isn't based on how good you can be this week. No. We want to be good people. We want to be moral people. We want to do the right thing. But we all know that we fail at that all the time. 
And if, or if we're putting all of the promises of God coming to us based on our perfection or our ability to do the right thing every time, then we're going to be disappointed all the time. Yeah. We're going to be condemned, we're going to feel guilty, and we're not going to get what God has given us freely. Amen? By His Son. So that one, that's what I'm really talking about here this morning. So now this is Jonah, and you all know the story of Jonah. You know, God tells him to do this thing, and he don't want to do it. And uh, the reason he doesn't want to do it is because he don't like the people that God's telling him to do it for. Right? right? So he runs away, and that's the beginning of the story. And I'm not going to read it all to you, but I think all of you probably know it well enough anyway. But now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Verse uh, 17, Peter. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So you know the interim here. He runs away from God, jumps on the ship. He's going the opposite direction that God told him to go. The ship gets caught in a storm. They throw him overboard because they figure he's the Jonah. Anybody ever heard that old expression? Probably older people here know the expression. Jonah was a bad deal. You know, whenever you're called a Jonah, you're like the bad luck thing. You know. So anyway, he says, it's all me. They throw him overboard, and God prepares this fish to swallow Jonah up. Amen. All right, chapter 2, Peter, verse 7 through 10. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto me, unto thee, unto thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have avowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So Jonah did what we just did here this morning, gave a sacrifice of praise, right? It wasn't something really easy to do because we got all these technical glitches and we're just trying to get through it and do the thing that we want to do, that we want to honor God and bless God. So that's basically what Jonah did. He just gave a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's not easy to give thanksgiving when you're in the belly of a whale. But that's what he was doing. He was saying, thank you, God. I know you're good. I know you're a merciful God. And so God had the whale spit him out or the big fish, whatever it was. Amen. All right. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Peter. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Amen. All right. Verse uh, 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. <laughs> this guy's a preacher. Amen. And he goes and preaches the mercy of God. If they'll repent, if they'll change their mind... And then when they do it, God is pleased because that's what he was after, was to show them mercy, was to give them salvation or to, to, to deliver them from themselves, basically. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, Lord, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? This is why he didn't want to go, because he knew if he went, God was going to do something for these people. Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful God, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. I mean, this is insane, is it not? You know, I mean, it, just, it baffles me, but not really, because now I think what God is trying to show us something here. So let me... Just tell me, who did God have the most problem with? Jonah or the Ninevites? Yeah. Right? And they were supposed to be the evil thing, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. When God got Jonah straightened out, he didn't have any problem with Nineveh. When Jonah did what God really wanted him to do, Nineveh did exactly what God wanted him to do, right? When God gets preachers straightened out, he doesn't have a problem with the people. 
Jonah had a message, and the message Jonah wanted to give was judgment. Yeah. But that wasn't God's message, and that's what made him mad. Yeah. Amen? God had a message, and that message was mercy. Yes. And he's the same yesterday, yeah. today, and forever. And I'm just saying this. If you're hearing messages, amen, of judgment, you're not hearing from God. Not in this dispensation. Amen. I don't care who's saying it. I don't care how big a name they've got. I don't care how many degrees they've got. It's not God. Right. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. I mean, God even gives Jonah, while well, he's bringing this up, even gives him an example here. You know, Noah go, or, or, uh, Jonah goes to the gate of, the, of, of Nineveh, and he's watching to see what's going to happen. And he's just ticked off. You know, he's really mad. And, and it's hot. It's out there in the middle of the Middle East. You know, it's hot. It's, it's terrible. So God, even knowing how Jonah feels about it, he causes this gourd, it's called in the Bible, to grow up and give him shade. In other words, it's like some plant just grows up overnight out of nowhere and creates this big, like a palm tree or something over him, so he's got shade. And what God is doing is giving him an example. And then the next day, all of a sudden, the thing's dead. And then Jonah goes through this whole poor me thing again and says, just take my life, you know, and all that. And God says, look, why, how can you be so upset about a gourd dying that you had nothing to do with? It came out of nowhere. You didn't create it and not care about these people. Something inanimate, just something that comes up and because it did something for you, but you didn't have anything to do with creating it. I did the work. I made it happen. Right? And you could be so upset because it's dead, but you were wanting to see this whole nation of people. In fact, the last verse or two of, of Jonah says, all these thousands of people you didn't care about. And he even mentions cattle. He said, all these people and all their cattle. You wanted them all destroyed. And yet you can weep over a gourd. That's how insane religion can be. Praise the Lord. So... He says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Amen? Now, the Revised Standard uh, Version reads, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Yes. So, by virtue of that teaching, there is a secret wisdom of God, something that's hidden, something that the average person probably doesn't see, or at least many people don't see it even though it's here, right? So look at, look at uh, Psalms 51, verse 6, uh, Peter. Psalms 51, verse 6. As usual, I'll be all over the place. I'm like K-I-O-A, random. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So truth or, or wisdom in the hidden part is what he's saying. Now, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, Paul was referring to this wisdom of God. Amen? It's a wisdom of God that is hidden in a secret place. Yes. Remember in the Old Testament, it talks about being hidden in the uh, go to the secret place of God under his wings, you know, you're protected and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the, kind of the, men, the, the thinking that's, go, that's being uh, uh, taught here. Colossians 1 Verse 21 through 27 now. So this hidden part where he'll show me wisdom or where he'll make me to know wisdom. Now, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard. The gospel that we already talked about first thing this morning is the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is grace, who brought grace to the earth, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The dispensation of God that, that Paul was in, the dispensation of God that we are in, is the dispensation of grace. All right? So, to fulfill the word of God. 
even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the secret place, the secret wisdom, amen, the secret knowledge, if it's hidden, then it's obviously it's out of sight. It can't be seen in the natural. So if we want to dwell in that secret place and find that secret wisdom, then we have to be willing to be hidden. Amen? We have to be led by the Spirit and not by the letter of the law, right? God's reality has to become our reality. Amen? We have to be hid in Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Yet not I, but I live in Christ. It's not me that liveth, but it's Christ, amen, that liveth in me. Yes. Praise the Lord. So we have to... We have to say what God says, amen, yes. not what we would say, yes. amen. We have to do what God does and not what we would do in the situation or the circumstance just out of our own flesh, amen. Yes. Old things have to pass away in order for all things to become new. Yes. So I said here a couple of weeks ago, the old thing that passed away is the old covenant and everything connected with it. In order for all things to become new, we have to have the one new thing, which is the new covenant or the covenant of grace. If you don't accept that one new thing, then nothing new will happen afterwards. God only did one new thing, and that was to give us the dispensation of grace or to give us Christ. Amen. And then out of that flows every new thing. And we all become new creatures in Christ. Amen. So all things do become new, but only if the initial becomes new. All right. So old covenant religion... And, and requirements have to be replaced by a new covenant relationship and grace, which is exactly what Don and others were talking about here this morning. This is about a relationship. This isn't about a religion. This is about having intimacy with God, yes. having this open yes. access to God at any time. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Yes. Amen. Not be tim intimidated or fearful because I screwed up yesterday or today or this morning or whatever. I can still come boldly to the throne of grace because God has declared me innocent yes. through Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. That's, that's, that's the most awesome thing. It's hard to get your head around it, to know that you can screw up and God still loves you. It doesn't change anything. Not that we just go out and screw up for the sake of the fact that we can get away with it, but we just look. It's, uh, we, we've all heard this cliche many times. You know, they're, 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 they're uh, what's the word? Um, they're, they're sinning, they, the, the grace gives them a license to sin, right? Well, then, you know, we're all sinning without a license. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been sinning without a license for a long time. It, nothing's changed. Right. What's changed is that God has acknowledged the fact that we are but dust. We are human. We are flesh. Our spirits have been made brand new. They are perfect. They are identical to Jesus Christ. My flesh is still the same flesh. I have to renew my mind because without the right thinking, I can't get this thing to do the right stuff. Right? I mean, we don't do anything without a thought first, right? So I have to renew my mind to my true reality, who I am in Christ, in order to ever get this thing to do anything proper, biblically speaking. And when it doesn't, it doesn't change my identity in terms of my relationship with God. Right. It just affects the people this way. It's what I said before, and I'll say it again. This thing, this sin deal between me and God is taken care of. It's over. It's finished. There's no more for me to do to get myself right with God. So when I sin now, it doesn't affect my relationship with God. It affects my relationship with people around me. Yes. Right? I mean, if I do things that's it, it, it's harmful to them or that creates issues for them, that's who I'm hurting. It's not hurting my relationship with God. It's just screwing up everything in my life down here. Yeah. It's not God judging me. It's me, you know, just getting the consequences of behavior. Praise the Lord. That's good news. That'll, this, if you ever get this thing settled that it's fixed, it'll help you with this. Yeah. It'll help you to want, not want to just be a screw-up and hurt other people all the time or do things that are hurtful or harmful to yourself or to others. Amen? So, praise the Lord. Jonah has to go before God can be revealed. Praise the Lord. And we have to let go of our reason and our opinions in order for God's truth to be revealed. Amen? All right, look at Ephesians chapter 4 now. And this is where I'm trying to get to now. And 
Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 6 through 13. I've said before, I used to get, I still get criticism. Fortunately, I haven't this week because the computer's been down. <laughs> That's where they all come from. Uh, and it used to bother me, and I used to try to retaliate or, or at least try to defend myself, you know. I don't worry about it anymore. I mean, if, they, if that's their opinion, I don't have to defend God. He doesn't need any defense. And if I'm saying what I believe God is saying, scripturally speaking, then I don't have to defend myself either. Just, you know, think what you want to think and believe what you want to believe, and you and God can sort it all out. So, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, all of this leading up to this is the grace of God, what Jesus has done. He has placed us in him. He has given us access to, to God. He has given us his grace so that we are no longer sinners in the eyes of God. We have been delivered from all of that. So he goes on to say, and then he gave us, why did he do this? Because our minds have to be renewed to who our identity truly is, which is a spirit, an eternal spirit born in the image of God, created after the image of God, reconnected with God. And so because of all of that, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up or the encouraging of the body, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and unto a perfect man, till we become Jesus. Amen? Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen? Now, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, you don't have to go there, Peter. In fact, you can go to Revelation 2, uh, verses 2 and 3. But in Revelation 1.20, it says that the, the seven messengers to the churches are in his right hand, and they are to declare the message of rest. Praise the Lord. All right, just remember that, because in Revelation 2, the message to the church at Ephesus, which is the Ephesians, which we just read, right? It's amazing to me, because the thing that he told the Ephesians is, I, here's, here's what I've done to make this thing believable to you. So you'll live this reality of who you really are in Christ and that you have been redeemed and so on and so forth. And he says, but here's the first thing he says to Ephesus. Amen? Ephesus is, a, is the, Ephes the Ephesians are just the people that lived in Ephesus, right? So he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. The first thing that he tells them to do. I'm going I'm to give you apostles. I'm going to give you prophets. I'm going to give you teachers and pastors and evangelists, so on and so forth. Right? He says, but I, I, I know your works and your labor. Your works and your labor. And your patience and how that thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars and has borne, and has patience, and for my namesake has labored, and has not fainted. So it was for his namesake that they labored, right? So he says, they have taught you these apostles that I gave you in Ephesians 4. These apostles have taught you works and labor that you did, but you did it for my namesake. In other words, yeah... They told you you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to, and you did it, but you did it based on me, thinking that it was for me, that you were blessing me somehow, right? All right. So look at verse five now. But by the way, they were liars. They were not true prophets or apostles, I should say. So remember, therefore, he's talking to the same people. He said, "Now I know why you did it, but it was still wrong." Right? So he says then, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. What, where was their fall? Well, it wasn't from something they did yesterday. It was this going back to the law. It was going back to doing works and labor for rest. 
to, to find the rest of God. So remember, therefore, from which thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So he's not telling them, again, he's not, he's not saying repent of, some, uh, of the cigarette you smoked last night, or the beer you drank yesterday, or the something that you said, or something you did, and I'm not telling you to go smoke, and I'm not telling you to get drunk, I'm just saying, that's not what he's talking about here, that's not the thing that he's asking for repentance of, he's saying, I want you to repent from, from this fall, amen, but he's telling them, remember what caused the original fall. Amen. Get back to the beginning. Amen. And remember from where you've fallen. Yeah. You, you were in grace. You were in Christ. You were in this place where you're in rest. It's, it's in, you're resting in the finished work of Jesus. It isn't about what you've got to do. It's what he has already done. Right? So he's telling them, don't, don't, don't remember or, 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 or remember from where you came from, from what was originally yours. Innocence. You were considered innocent back in the garden, right? So that was that that fall was the feeding from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because before they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they didn't know good or evil. They were just innocent, right? right? So look at verse seven. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise the Lord. So Jesus connects this church clear back to the Garden of Eden by telling them, if you overcome, in other words, if you'll overcome this self-works labor, you know, if you'll overcome that mentality, amen, I'll give you to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen? I'll take you back to where the tree of life existed before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look at Galatians now, chapter 3, 9 through 14. Galatians 3, 9 through 14. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, for as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that come, continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man who doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So that tree in the midst of paradise is the cross of Jesus. He just told us that's where the curse was done away with. Yes. The curse of being under the law or curse of knowledge of, uh, of good and evil. Praise the Lord. So this tree, amen, once we, when we feed from that tree, from the cross, from the finished work of Jesus, amen, we cease from our labors. Yes. Amen. Because the work is finished. Jesus said it. It is finished. When we feed from that tree, we have eternal life. Yes. It's, no, it's not about us anymore. It's about what he has done. Praise the Lord. The true apostle, he preaches the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just like the apostle Paul, who said, I'm determined to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. I don't see your failures. I don't see your weaknesses. I don't deal with you that way. I deal with you. By the blood of Jesus, I only see, when I see you, I see Christ and Him crucified. That's what He's done. You are a new creature in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, a true apostle restores us to our first love. Amen? And that's not motivated by law or punishment, but by the love of God. He, we love Him because He first loved us. When we were unlovable, when we were still in all of our sin, separated from Him, before we accepted Christ, He still loved us and gave Himself for us. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. So the next thing they talked about in, in Ephesus, or in Ephesians, was the prophet. Praise the Lord. Now I'm talking about what this church is supposed to be today, based on the Word of God. Not on how big the denomination is or how many people are in the building. Praise the Lord. In Pergamos, go to uh, Revelation 2, verse 12. So 
So we're talking about the next thing he says after the apostle was a prophet. Yes. Now he says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. All right, verse 14. Is this, is this, is that verse 2? Chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 12. Okay. To the angel of church in Pergamos write these things, saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So, what Balaam represents, this is what the thing he says he has against him, right? The second deal, the prophets, right? What Balaam represents is a prophet for hire, who's prophesying for his benefit not for the people he's prophesying to. All right? Now, think about this. God, this was written 2,000 years ago or more, or, well, at least 2,000 years ago when Paul or, or, or John is on the Isle of Patmos. That actually literally means my death. Praise the Lord. In other words, he, his, he was dying so that Christ would rise in him, so that he would actually have this revelation of who he was in Christ. So now... God is saying, he gives us this letter that he writes to the Ephesians saying, and this is what I've given you to make the church healthy, to make the church grow, to make the church see who, what its identity is and so that it can function the way that it's supposed to function. And now in the book of Revelation, Jesus appears to these churches, to these seven churches, which represent the entire body of Christ. And he's correcting then, already then, there were these problems. But he's also projecting this into the future, knowing that in the last days, this stuff will be happening too, and it has to be addressed. Because we're not getting a revelation. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ, not just a mind-blowing picture of a bunch of weird stuff. It's a picture of Jesus that we're supposed to have a revelation of. And if our revelation of Jesus is skewed in any way, if it's twisted or, or deformed, then it doesn't present Christ to the church in a way that the church can then present it to the world. So the world is getting a mixed message and a screwed up picture of Christ. And therefore God. Yeah. Amen? So he represents a prophet that's for hire. All right, look at Numbers chapter 24 now, verse 5 through 9. Jody mentioned this here a few months back about, and this is what this refers to, about whenever Israel would camp, they always camped in what looked to be a cross. If you were looking down on it, and you can read that, it'll tell you how they camped by, by uh, tribes and how that would have projected into a cross from looking down on it. Okay? So how godly are thy tents, O Jacob? This is what he's talking about. This is Balaam, right? So how godly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are, they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line, aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations as his enemies, and shall break their bones, and pierce them through with his arrows." He couched, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. He's talking about Jesus. Amen? This was a picture of, a cro of the cross, and he talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah. He talks about, you know, this, uh, the, the, this rising up and becoming the reality of what Israel is representing is the coming of the Messiah, of God coming to earth, amen, through people. Praise the Lord. So Israel camped in the shape of a cross, and he says, God has blessed Jacob. Who can curse him? Right? If God's blessed him, who can curse him? The new covenant prophet will bless and not curse. Right. How can, if you are a believer, how can I come in here and try to put you back under the law, which is a curse? Yeah. 
I can't curse what God has blessed. Yeah. Right? But that's what we have in religion today. We have prophets that are trying to curse what God has blessed. Yeah. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. And I'm not picking on individuals. I'm just saying, hey, I, I, I don't know what their motive is. I don't care what their motive is. If it's ignorance, if it's just traditions that they can't break away from, if it's, it's denominations that they can't get out of, or whatever it is, that's irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. The truth is, we are supposed to be, and we're all supposed to prophesy. We're all supposed to be kings, amen, and priests and prophets. Well, you cannot prophesy destruction to people who have been blessed. You can't without being a false prophet. So bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. So everybody operating under the law is still under a curse, right? It's written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, here's the law. I forget now 600 and some different things that you've got to do. And it says, if, if you're under the law, then you are bound to every one of those. Not just the big ten or not just the ones you are capable of handling, but every law. And if you break one of them, you're cursed because of that. Right? So you're under all of them, right? Verse 14. that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, not by the law. Right? So the only way, based on that and many other scriptures, the only way to curse somebody that's in the new covenant, that's born again, amen, is to put them back under the law. That's the only way I can curse you, amen, is to force you back under the law to where now grace does not benefit you. You're either under one or the other. So if I preach to you the law and put you back under the law, now I've just, I've just cursed you. Praise the Lord. New Testament prophets speak from the mercy seat, yes. not from judgment. They speak to God's promises, not your problems. Praise the Lord. Yes. Old Testament prophets bring your sin to remembrance. That's what they were doing. Doing. That's what they were supposed to do under the law. New Testament prophets declare your righteousness. Yes. I'm not saying the days of the prophets are over. I'm just saying the days of the Old Testament prophets are over. Elijah gives way to Elisha. It's a type. Right? He gets the double portion and the whole thing, right? And Jesus said, you'll do greater, work, greater works than these shall you do. You go in my name. Right? So, Elijah ends with a, the Yah, the J-A-H, Jehovah. Uh, it's the Old Testament names of God are all included in Jehovah. Jehovah, we've got it somewhere where we used to have it, I guess. Nisi, you know, all of the, all the names of, uh, of the Lord. And those all reflect judgment of some kind. You do this, I'll do this, right? Demands and, and responses, praise the Lord. But Elisha, S-H-A, is the God of salvation, or it represents salvation. So that's the difference. Elijah, the judgment goes away and is replaced with forgiveness, with mercy, with salvation. Praise the Lord. So Elijah's calling down fire, amen, shutting up the heaven so that there's no rain, so stuff will die and, you know, diminish and so forth. And Elijah is filling the widow's barrel and her oil, amen, and raising the dead, Healing lepers, praise the Lord, making axe heads float, which is a type of debt that can't be repaid, right? The guy borrowed the axe head and it sinks, and so Elijah has it float so he can get it back and give it back to where it belongs. So Elisha is handling all of our needs. He's showing provision, amen, when we don't deserve provision. But he's doing it because it's by faith, because God sent Elisha to the widow, right? To, to, heal, to get her son back, to keep him from going into bondage and so on and so forth. So... The ministry, the primary focus of, of Elijah's ministry is focused on salvation and restoration. Amen? Yeah. 
And so today we've got guys and gals that claim to be prophets, and they say that God is going to destroy America, or God is judging America. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Every time something happens, it's the judgment of God. No, it's Americans are destroying America. If America gets destroyed, it'll be by Americans. It won't be by God. Right? God has blessed us. Praise the Lord. So they claim that, well, you know, the hurricanes, the, the wildfires, the tornadoes, the floods, the, you know, all these things are, are, are God's judgment. But if you want to see how Jesus reacts to a hurricane or to storms or to inclement weather or bad things that are destructive, amen, he's asleep in this boat, right? And he's at rest. There's a storm raging, but he's, he's resting, right? And so the disciples come and they wake him up. He doesn't get up and say, oh my God, the judgment's of God. This is an act of God. If you want to know what an act of God looks like, this is an act of God. Jesus, who's been given dominion and authority, says, peace, be still. Yes. Praise the Lord. An act of God is when instead of prophesying judgment, uh -huh. we begin to exercise New Testament redemptive dominion and we rebuke the catastrophes, we rebuke the attacks of the enemy instead of trying to blame them on God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Again, how can you have a revelation of Jesus with that kind of mentality? Yeah. Right? You may have a revelation, but it's going to be a screwed up revelation. And because of that, you're not going to get the benefits of what God really wants for you. All right? The next thing on that list was evangelist. And that word evangelist, actually it's a Greek word, and it translates glad tidings or good news or preachers of good news. Praise the Lord. Now... I can tell you this. I remember when we first got saved, we were in East Texas, a big church, large Pentecostal church. And they'd have this, they had a lot of, we had a lot of quote unquote revivals. And they had this one guy that came at least once a year and sometimes twice a year. And I could tell you his name right now. He pastored in Houston for a number of years after he got off the evangelistic field. And that guy, he didn't preach good news. He, he had a whole video series of horror things that were happening around the world and that would probably happen here and the end of the world, you know, nuclear holocaust and the whole, everything, all these kind of, I mean, they would freak you out. If you sat through a, an hour of that, you'd, you'd be at the altar or out in the parking lot with a gun to your head. I mean, it was just that freaky, you know, it was, it was horrifying. And he told us how bad we were, what was wrong with us, how we were going to bust hell wide open, you know, and all that stuff, amen, and uh, how doomed we were to tell us all these horrible world events and scare people to the altars, amen. Dangle us over hell for a week or two, you know, until everybody, according to them, repented. I, I, this is a God's honest truth. One time, I don't remember if it was him or not, but it was another evangelist that said, there was a kid sitting in the back of the church, and he had on a red shirt, if I remember right. I think it was red, but I'm going to use red just because that's a vivid color. And he was telling, uh, he was telling these horror stories about young people that had refused to come to the altar at a meeting, and they died. They killed in a car wreck. You know, as soon as they left the church, they all died in a horrible, fiery car crash. <laughs> and, of course, he's saying God did that because they didn't come to the altar. That's his implication, right? So he's looking in the back, and there's a, kid, there's a couple of young people back there, probably in their early teens, mid-teens or something. And he says, you, in the red shirt, God's saying, if you don't come to this altar now, you will not live through the night. You'll die tonight. Now, if I'd have been his mom or dad, I'd have went up and punched him right in the... I'd given him the right hand of fellowship right across the face. I mean, that was just ignorant, and it was freaking this kid out, but it's making this kid think, God's going to kill me. Right? Right? So that's the kind of stuff that they would do. And then they would leave, and they'd brag about how many people got saved at their last meeting. Yeah. But they didn't bother to tell you that it was the same people that got saved in the last meeting he was at. Yeah. Now, I can say this for myself, because I preached around churches all over Iowa and Nebraska and, and Texas. And when I, when I was in this organization, I'd see the same people 
in the altar, no matter where I was at, if it was in that group of ch where those churches were within proximity of one another, the same people would be back, back there because they're, they're waiting for the, you know, you haven't done everything you were supposed to do. And I was really pretty easy, I mean, compared to a lot of people. But, but I remember, you know, you'd see them and here they'd come again crying and, and freaking out and everything else. But it was the same one that I saw the week before at somebody else's church. Right. Why? Because I had just preached him out of faith uh -huh. and into the law. Right? And that's exactly what's happened over the years. They'd say, well, we, got, we had this big revival, and, and they would talk about how their salvation was preached, and what they actually did was preach the law and shut up faith. Yeah. Took their faith out of the goodness and love of God and put it under my responsibility to do this or do that. Right? And if you preach that long enough, they become unbelievers because you're going to preach either faith or you're going to preach unbelief. Right. If you preach enough of the law long enough, they become unbelievers. Now they, they have to get their mind totally renewed again, amen, in order to... So, I, I mean, I believe in genuine altar calls, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times we'd be better off or we'd have more success if we had people who were strong enough, strong enough in believing not to constantly feel like they're undone and, and going to go to hell again because they did something this week. You only stay on that religious treadmill so long. Eventually, amen, you'll get fed up. You'll get tired of failure. And you'll give up and quit. And I saw it over and over and over in Texas here and other places that I've been, and people that I knew. And they were not living, they were saved, but they weren't living like they should live. And they'd come back and they'd get told how, you know, you're, you're you, you've, uh, what, what, what was the word they loved to use all the time? Backslid. You're backslid, which basically implied that you're lost. And unless you get your stuff all together, now God's not going to have nothing to do with you. As if somehow it was something they did in the first place that got them saved. Well, they'd, they'd ride that roller coaster, you know, for a number of years usually until they'd get so embarrassed and so humiliated and so beat up and so confused that they'd finally just say, forget it. And they'd end up spending the majority of the rest of their life drinking and drugs and, you know, screw ups and message one thing after another. Why? Because they didn't feel like there was any hope for them in God. So I might as well just blow this thing wide open and have a good time because I'm only here for a little while. Yep. Praise the Lord. So the problem with getting people saved by fear is then you've got to keep them fearful of God because that's what you got them afraid of, made them come to God. Amen. And so if you do that, then you've got to keep them afraid of God. Praise the Lord. And the problem with fear is what you fear, eventually you'll end up hating. Praise the Lord. God is love. And perfect love casts out fear. Yes. Amen. Second Timothy 1, 7 through 10. We'll go a little faster here. Praise the Lord. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the Gospels. Praise the Lord. All right, now I want to compare two scriptures here real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13. So this is Old Covenant, Deuteronomy 6.13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. All right, now Jesus quotes this scripture when he's attacked by the devil. Amen. He tells him, just bow to me and I'll give you all these kingdoms and everything else. So this is the very scripture that Jesus quotes in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. But I want you to see how the mind of Jesus translates this. What we call fear the Lord Look, he says, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He, he exchanges the word fear for the word worship. Now, believe me, you don't worship something you're afraid of. 
You may kneel to it. You may knuckle under to it, but you're not worshiping it. You're fearful of it. Amen? And that's the point Jesus is trying to make. Good news will always cause people to fall in love with God. Not be afraid and run from Him every time they screw up, but feel comfortable in coming to Him with their issue. Knowing that He's not going to reject me. He's not going to cast me off. Amen? They fall in love with God, and the goodness of God will bring about worship. True worship. The, the Lord seeketh them to worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's the only way you really can worship Him. You can't worship Him out of fear. Right? right? All right. Next one is the pastor. The pastor, in the book of Revelation, all seven messengers are to the angel of the church, and that word is uh, in Strong's Concordance, number 32, uh, in the uh, Greek, and it's agalos, or uh, it comes from the word agalo, and it means to bring tidings. It's a messenger, so by implication, and that's the way it's defined in there, by implication, pastor. So all of the messages are first sent to the pastor's of these churches to repent or to change their mind. So that's why I take this seriously. This isn't just written not only to you. It is written to everybody, but it's also written to these people who have positions to fulfill. Not, it isn't, they're not elevated. They're not any greater than anybody else because everybody has the potential for this. But he's telling you, if you're going to pastor, you better get your act together. You better know what it is you're teaching people because I hold you responsible. It doesn't mean I'm lost. It just means that I can't do what the, the ministry has told me to do, amen, through Christ, unless I do it the way he tells us to do it. Exactly. So he says, if you're not going to, basically he tells them, if you're not going to do this the way it's supposed to be, then I'm going to take away your ability to pastor. He, he says it on further on. He says, okay, for those that overcome, this is going to happen. But if you don't do it, I'll take away your candlestick. In other words, I'll take that pastor out of there. Right. Praise the Lord. So all of these messages are first to the pastors. Now, from the old covenant uh, mentality, he's telling us you're, you're supposed to be bringing them from a old covenant mentality to a new covenant mentality. That's your responsibility. Whether you're an apostle, whether you're a prophet, whether you're an evangelist or a, a pastor. The job of the ministry is to get you out of that old covenant mindset and into the new covenant mindset where you can be the body of Christ. It's the only way you can be that. Yes. You can be a religion. You can be a denomination, but you cannot be the body of Christ. You cannot be a reflection of Jesus. You can't be a revelation of Jesus if you're not like Jesus. Exactly. Praise the Lord. So, uh, the promise made to them who overcome, if you look at it, you can go back and read it for yourself. The first two chapters is all about these seven churches. And the promises to them who overcome these things that he says, I have this against you, I have this thing against you. The promise to them who overcome is the blessings of the new covenant. So it isn't like, you know, God's going to do a new thing. He's saying, if you'll get your head right, get your heart right with the new covenant, with the blessings of God, you'll get the benefit of it. You'll, you'll, right. you'll be blessed. Right. And that's what he says. If you overcome that, neg that old covenant mindset, you're going to be blessed automatically. It's going to happen because of the grace of God. Right? So uh, Ephesus, he says, move away from the work and the labor and receive the tree of life. Right? Move away from this idea that it's your work, it's your labor, and what's going to happen? You get the tree of life. You get the benefits of the cross. You get the finished work. You get to rest in what Jesus has already done. Amen? Smyrna, he says, move away from the sufferings and mentality, this mentality they had of, of being oppressed and, and suffering all the time for, for Jesus and so forth. He says, if you move away from that, You'll get the crown of life. You'll rule and reign. Right? Pergamos, he says, move away from the prophets who curse people and receive the hidden manna. Praise the Lord. The white stone and a new name. That white stone was a stone that represented righteousness in the ephod when they would cast those out, right? Sardis, it had a reputation of being alive, but they were really dead. I mean, they had some really good services, very entertaining, but the Spirit of God was not in it, 
right? So he says, they, you have this reputation of being alive, but you're really dead. And because of that, you have defiled your white garments. You defiled the white garments by thinking it was about you, right? And he says, if you overcome, then you're going to be given white raiment. What is that? The righteousness of God. We receive it as a gift in the new covenant, and we get our name in the book of life. That's what he promises them that overcome. He's just telling them, get out of that old covenant mindset, and you'll get the benefit of the new covenant promises. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. So in Philadelphia, he promises them, because they're this church of love, they love each other, that they're going to become the temple of God. God is love. No, you're not. You are the temple of God, right? And they'll, they'll, they'll become the temple of God. They'll become the new Jerusalem, and he'll give them a new name and a new nature, his nature. He's given you his name. He has taken you as his bride. You have the use of the name of Jesus as though it were your own. You, you speak it as though it were Jesus saying it, and God gives you the benefit of that. All right? Laodicea. He says, if you repent, if you'll change your mind about this lukewarm attitude that you have, the, this blindness attitude of thinking that you're rich when really you're poor, spiritually speaking, he says you are spiritually in poverty, even though you think you're rich. He promised them if they would overcome, he would sup with them. A picture of communion in the new covenant where there's healing, where there's deliverance, there's all these things available, amen, through the, the act of communion. And he says, and you will sit with me in the throne. In other words, you will function as kings and priests, which is a promise to the new covenant believer. You see what I'm saying? It's not like he's judging. He's just saying, look, here's the problem. If you'll just get away from that, you get the benefit of everything I promised. But as long as you're operating there, you can't have this. You've got to repent. You've got to change your mind in order to get the benefit, in order to get the promises. Not... You've got to really get your stuff together here and get clean and act right and smell right and do right and be right or you're not going to get... To... No, he just says, stop thinking the way you're thinking and these blessings are already yours. They're available to you. They'll just come to you as a result of how you believe. Again, he said, you'll sit with me on my throne. And again, his throne is not a judgment seat, which means we don't have any right to be judging people, amen, that fail. You can have an opinion, but we all know what opinions are like. Praise the Lord. We all got them, right? But they just are opinion. His word is what matters. And your opinion may be valid in, in a culture that we live in, amen, and in the environment or the legal systems that we deal with, but it doesn't mean sick them to God. You still got to obey those laws in order to not get the consequences of them. But it doesn't mean we operate by the same rules and regulations. We still have to love people even when they're failures, yes. even when they're screw-ups, because we're seated with Him in heavenly places. And that place where we're seated is His throne, and that throne is not a throne of judgment. It's the throne of mercy. It's the mercy seat from where we flow. And if we don't do that, I'm telling you, yeah, we, I know we've got things that we're going to have to deal with, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this. God is trying us. Yes. Not us, but our faith. What we truly believe. And crap will happen as it does in everybody's life. It happens to churches. And he is just saying, wonder how they're going to respond to this. Are they going to overcome? Or are they going to let old covenant and legalistic ways of looking at things dominate them? If they do, then they don't, have a, they don't have access to the promises of God. This isn't what I'm saying. It's not my opinion. I'm not trying to enforce them. I'm just saying that's how we struggle with these consistencies when it comes to healing and deliverance and prosperity. And, and uh, It's all about how we're looking at things. And if our revelation of Jesus and the way we portray Him is, is mixed up, then our ability to receive the benefits of what He's provided for us is messed up. Yeah. And it's maybe work today, but doesn't work tomorrow. It might work for you, Jane, but it won't work for Sally. Or it might work for you, but it won't work for me. Right. What's supposed to be working for all of us? It's the same God, the same anointing, the same promise. And to the same people, as far as God's concerned, I only see Jesus. Yes. Right? That's what God sees. All He sees is Jesus and Him crucified. Amen. 
Man, think about it. That's why he, Jesus can say, as he loved me, he loves you. Yeah. He loves you the same way he loved Jesus. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. The problem is we know we're screwed up. We know we got issues. But God doesn't. Men do, but God doesn't. He's cast our, those things as far as the east is from the west. He will not impute our sins or our unrighteousness to us. He has already imputed the righteousness of Christ to us. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. We're about done here. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall there be lacking, saith the Lord. That's where God wants us to be where there is no lack, where we have come back to the, to the place that God has, increased, has in, uh, promised to us and be fruitful and increase and not be afraid anymore or confused and dismayed. Right. Neither will they be lacking. That's the promise that God has for us. But you only get there one way. Yeah. You've got to do it the right way. You've got to believe what the Word of God says. You got to preach what the Word of God says. And we're all preachers. We're all teachers. We're, we're all these things. When we interact with other people, we've got to remember that. Yes. They need to know yes. God loves them, yes. even if they're not born again. Yes. So they know they got issues, or they, you know, everybody does. I it certainly didn't have to have somebody come and tell me I was screwing up when I was screwing up. I knew it. I just didn't know how to get away from it. I didn't, just didn't know how to get past it. Right. Praise the Lord. Last one is teacher. And this one, he, the teacher, he, he addresses in Thyatira. Uh, Revelation 2, verse 20, Peter. Now, some of these I've talked about a little bit here and there at different times, so if I repeat myself, forgive me. I'm 70 years old. <laughs> My mind has been renewed. Praise the Lord. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I believe it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And we've talked about this before. Jezebel, it's not, he's not speaking against women. Obviously, Jesus had women on equal terms with men. They preach, they, pa they, they pastor, they prophesy, they, they do everything a man does, you know, spiritually speaking. So, but he's talking about a spirit. The spirit of Jezebel, which was the woman who, you know, was, tried to come against uh, Isaiah or uh, Elijah uh, and was going to have him killed and all this kind of stuff. So that was the whole deal. And she manipulated her husband, who was half Jewish, and, and, and brought in Baal worship into Israel and all these mixed up religious teachings. So because of, you suffer, he said, I have this few things against you. And one is that you allow this woman, this Jezebel, that calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So fornication, he's simply talking about, because we're dealing with spiritual realities here, and he's simply talking about intimacy outside of marriage is what fornication means. And he says, so he said, what he's saying is you're, you're having intimacy with somebody besides Jesus. In other words, you're letting some other God or, or worship form or or religious kind of teaching take the place of God. So you can't be intimate with him, right? So that's what he's talking about. So she's, th that spirit is bringing back law. It's bringing back legalism to keep us. You can't be intimate with God if you think God's going to be angry with you, right? I mean, you can't be open and free with God if you think that God's going to get you because of the last bad thing you did or said or thought, right? So that's what he's talking about. So we're married to Christ. And then he, then he says, and, and, and uh, to having them eat things that are offered to idols. Now, this isn't about eating barbecue that was given to some false image or something. 
It's talking about when we feed on concepts about God that aren't true, amen, we're feeding on false images. We're eating idolatry. We're taking in idolatry, amen? All right? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. So as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So we were born into this world in the image of a human being, just of a, of a man. And just as true as that is, he tells you, you will also bear the image of the heavenly. Yeah. Or when you get born again, spiritually alive. You, you bear the image of God, the, the heavenly image. Praise God. So Revelation 2, verse 26 through 29. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessel of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, saith unto the churches. So we've talked about this one before, but I'll just, just go back over it a moment. He's going to give us power over false images. If, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Yeah. So if you understand the true teaching of the new covenant, of the teaching of grace, it will set you free. It will give you power over these false images, these, these false teachings, amen, that don't really reveal the truth of God. Right. Amen? And I said this before. He's going to give us power over nations. I, this is one of them I talked about in the past. He said power over what? Power over imaginations. Images yes. that come to our mind that tell us things that are contrary to the Word of God. And power over denominations, which try to dictate to you something separate from what the Word of God says, simply to keep you in their group. Yes. I mean, I can tell you, when we were, uh, again, when we were in Texas, there was, I think, five apostolic, what we call apostolic churches, which were, you know, most of you know what I'm talking about, Pentecostal apostolic churches. There were five of them in this town of about 12,000 people that we lived in east of Beaumont. Uh -huh. and, uh, and they all taught the same thing. Basic, the basic salvation message was identical. The difference was idiotic. It was whether a woman wore her hair up or she wore it down. Or whether you wore long sleeve shirts buttoned all the way to the top or if the top button could be unbuttoned. I mean, it was just insane kind of differences that they would just nitpick at. Why? Because we know we're saved because we got the button buttoned at the top button, right? But we're not sure about them. Even though they do the same stuff we do, those guys are running around with the top button undone, yeah. right? Or their women are like floozies because they wear open-toed shoes. Yeah. Or instead of having their hair up on top of their head, they have their hair down. Uh -huh. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but see, if you're indoctrinated, if, you're, if you come to Jesus in that environment, you think, hey, I got saved. I know I got saved. Right. So this all must, it must all be true. Right? Even though you may not put the emphasis on those things, you just assume. But it was just a way of manipulating people to keep them from leaving my group and paying their tithes somewhere else or giving their offerings to somebody else. It had nothing to do with whether they were saved or not. But they believed that it had something to do with them being saved or not, and that's why they would not leave, because they were scared to death that God would get them if they went to that other church. Right. Now you say, well, man, what kind of cult was this? Well, it's, it's, called Baptist, uh, it's called the Baptist Church, it's called the Methodist Church, it's called the Lutheran Church, it's called the Catholic Church, it's called the you know, Church of Christ. It's, called, it's denominations, amen, that are spo we're, we're are supposed to come together in the faith, not in denominational doctrinal issues. It says in the faith of Jesus. That's how we're supposed to be coming together. But denominations have made that impossible because you can't fellowship. I was told when I left the organization that God was going to kill me. I swear to God, by people that had lived in that and been a part of that church for 20 years or more, came right down to where, when I was working at Eagle Iron and waited for me to come out the gate at the end of the day and to prophesy to me that God was going to kill me. And I had a Harley at the time, and I wrecked it coming home from work one day.
because they were doing a bunch of road work and they didn't have the shoulders finished and a guy kind of didn't sideswipe me, but he got close and I moved over. And when I moved over, I went off like a four foot drop. Well, on a motorcycle doing 50 miles an hour, there isn't a whole lot of you know, wiggle room. And when I hit, the, the, my front tire got turned and it just flipped me end over end right down the highway. And they, I guarantee you, they were having a shout and fit at that church because, hey, my prophecy came to pass. No, that was your curse. And you can't curse what God has blessed. Right. Worst thing that happened, I got some bruised ribs, a dislocated shoulder, and, a, and I kind of looked like Van Gogh for about a week because my ear was half off. But, hey, it had nothing to do with God. It had to do with me not doing what I should have done. You know, you go where you look. That's the first thing they teach you on a motorcycle. I looked down, and that's where I ended up. But it wasn't God. But I'm saying that's the kind of religious mentality that some people were no doubt rejoicing over, thinking, well, they, he got him. Yeah. Told him he was going to, you know, because he left our group. Yeah. That's pathetic. Yeah. And it's so unlike God. It's so anti-Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. So all this, and I, I'm done, okay, but all this just tells me it's time to change the way we do ministry. Yes. To one another, to people outside, to anybody. Yes. God wants to lay his hand of fivefold ministry on those who have an understanding of rest and the finished work of Jesus. Yes. And he'll use you for that. Yes. Ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter that killeth, but of the spirit that gives life. Yes. Praise the Lord. See Christ, him crucified. Only his grace is sufficient. And it is sufficient for all things. It is finished. That's the good news. And that's the only news God really wants preached. Anything other than that is a, is a twisting of the truth, is a deforming of the image of God. Praise the Lord. And it's high time. God wants us blessed. He wants us to have the, He wouldn't have died to give us these things if he didn't want us to have it. He didn't want to just die and make it possible for those to be realities and then just watch us be frustrated for the next 2,000 years. These were our choices. And the moment we come into agreement and align ourselves with God and His Word, these things just happen. You don't have to be a special anointed person. You don't, you've got the only anointing there is, and that's Jesus Christ, the anointed. And it all belongs to you. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Give Him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for your patience. Amen. We ought to be the happiest people on planet Earth. Praise God. We've got everything going for us in our favor. We've got God on our side. Who can be against you? Praise the Lord. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.